Today's guest, one of the finest sports writers and analysts this country has produced, Scott Morrison. Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show, coming up! Our guest today hails from Toronto. He has spent over 40 years as a sports writer. He is former sports editor with the Toronto Sun. He is author of numerous books, former president of the Professional Hockey Writers Association, a commentator for Hockey Night in Canada, executive producer of Hockey for Sportsnet, a member of the Ontario Sports Hall of Fame. The Associated Press North American Award winner received Hockey Hall of Fame's Elmer Ferguson Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the program, Scott Morrison. Scotty, great to have you here, my friend. Great to be here, Joe. Thanks very much. So we like to start at the beginning. How did you get into the business? Did you always know that the sports writing was going to be for you? I did. And for whatever reason, from a very young age, I just loved reading the newspaper. And, uh, you know, back as, as a kid, there was a you know, morning paper and you could get an afternoon papers as well. And, uh, I remember coming home from school and I just I couldn't wait to hear the sound of the paper dropping hit the door and I'd rush for it and obviously go to the sports section first. Although when I wanted decided that this was the career I wanted to pursue, it never was sports, uh, that it had to be sports entirely. I was just wanted to get into the business. And so, you know, from a very young age, uh, you know, I started writing and I can remember in public school, I put together one project that we had to do. I I put together my own little newspaper and uh, I would write letters to the editor of the newspaper so I could get, if they got published, it was a thrill and I could uh, <clears throat> start putting together a portfolio. So I had the bug from a, from a very early age. The Morrison Daily. I, I never had got a chance yeah. to read that paper. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so tell me, uh, yeah. So how did you get into the, so you, you, you're, you're writing everything, you're writing news, sports, whatever. Uh, how did you get the gig at, at the uh, Toronto Sun? Well, I was, uh, while I was going to, uh, well, I was in high school and I was, played hockey in the, what was the MTHL back then, the Metro Toronto Hockey League. And uh, uh, I got in touch with the, the gentleman, John Gardner was his name, who actually coached me for a year. And he was the president of the league. And myself and a buddy hatched an idea of what if we put together, I believe it was a, a monthly newspaper just with news and notes about the league schedules all sorts of stuff like that he loved the idea and he went out and sold ads for it and so we started doing that and then uh the globe and mail started running in its uh, monday paper uh a weekly uh, mthl page and i did some work for that and then uh i decided that uh, maybe the best way to try and uh, get my foot in the door at various places was to call up with story ideas so i would go to uh, some of the major minor hockey tournaments uh, back in the day, the midget tournaments, the peewees, that sort of thing. And I would phone the papers and say, you know, all I want is a byline and I'll, I'll get you your story. And uh, the sun was very receptive. And uh, and so I did a lot of, uh, of that type of unpaid freelance work, if you will. And the next thing you know, they were calling me and uh, and I was working on a regular basis, uh, you know, covering various things, high school sports to you know, soccer tournaments, to swim meets, to minor hockey events, and uh, all through sort of high school. And then when I got into college, Centennial College in Scarborough, uh, I was basically working full time at the paper. And I remember saying to the professors, I said, I'm not sure what to do here. And they just said, well, you're going to get a lot of experience there that you wouldn't get here, but try to come to as many classes and do as many papers or assignments as, as you can. And uh, we'll make sure we get you through this, but uh, good on you for basically having a full-time job. And once I graduated, uh, I walked right in. You know, I was full-time after a couple months, full full-time at that point, instead of a freelancer. So who was running this, the uh, St uh, Sun Sports at the time? Uh, the legendary George Gross was the sports editor. George okay. Gross was the sports right. editor. And, uh, yeah, and uh, George took a shining to me. And, uh, you know, he appreciated hard workers. And uh, that was the one thing. I was there as many hours of the day as I could be. I go out, do my assignment. I come back and write my story. 
I would sit and watch the editor go over it so I could learn and see the mistakes I was making. I'd hang out uh, in what we called the back shop where they'd paste up uh, the papers and get them ready. I was just a, a sponge trying to uh, soak in as much as I could about the business. You mentioned George liked people who work hard. I mean, who doesn't, obviously? And it, clearly you worked hard because eventually you became a, you know, editor of the, of the sports section. And it became the, the, uh, one of the top 10 sports sections in North America, which was a, a, a first for a Canadian paper. Uh, I'm thinking that you probably had a little bit to do with that. Well, we had a great team. Uh, you know, it was nice to be sort of help shape the vision a little bit, if you will. But uh, <clears throat> between our writers and our editors and our designers, we had a fabulous team and a dedicated team. And the competition back then between the papers was so intense. Uh, you know, the Star, the Globe, and the Sun. And, uh, you know, you're fighting for circulation. You were fighting for advertising. And you were fighting to break news every day. And for, for us to be in the, the top circulation category, and to be one of the top 10 papers in North America was just an absolute thrill and a, and a feather in everybody's hat because everybody shared in, in that excitement and, uh, and uh, that recognition. And uh, it was pretty special. I remember the, the award ceremony it was the Associated Press Sports Editors Awards. And we were in Chicago for the conference. And uh, all of a sudden, there's a sports editor for the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the LA Times, the Chicago Tribune. And then they call up the guy from the Toronto Sun. Well, that was uh, a pretty amazing moment for all of us. You know, the, uh, there, you talked about fighting for stories. And obviously, it was the same in local television, too. I mean, Mark Hipsher yeah. and I almost literally fought at spring training one, <laughs> one year for trying to get a George Bell interview. But, you know, that's another story for a different day. But uh, you, you, you did a lot of uh, television work. Tell us how that came about for you. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> when there were some big stories uh, that would, would make the national news or whatnot, CTV seemed to, to like me and would call quite often. I'd be on, with, do a double ender with, uh, with Lloyd Robertson talking about whatever the big story of the day was in the hockey world. And then, but really where it evolved was uh, uh, you know, a mutual friend of ours, Mark Askin, who was producing uh, Leaf broadcast back in the day, and especially the midweek games. He, uh, he came up with an idea of, uh, of having me appear on the, I think it was the first intermission, with, uh, with a segment called Stop the Press, where I do news and notes uh, from around the league. And, you know, back then you didn't have internet the way we have today and, you know, news flowing uh, around as, as, as easily and readily as it does. So uh, a lot of the information was, uh, was unknown because I'd be working the phones and calling around the league. And I would do a weekly notebook for the, for the paper. Uh, every Sunday as it was. So uh, so Mark came up with that idea born out of me doing the weekly notebook. And uh, and so that was really my uh, first kick at it. And that went on for numerous years. And then all of a sudden, if I was at a game, he put me on the post games. And, uh, and then it evolved that I started doing some stuff with the TSN and would appear on uh, on That's Hockey. I think Gordon Miller was the, was the host back then. John Wells had a Saturday morning hourly show or two hour show. It wasn't just hockey, but sports in general, and I was a regular there. And then when Sportsnet was born, the Leaf rights, the regional rights went uh, to them. And so I effectively went with the, the rights to Sportsnet, but I was still working at the paper at the time. And then in 2001, uh, uh, we had a bit of a breakup with the paper. The uh, publisher and I at the time didn't see eye to eye on some things. And uh, and Sportsnet came to me and said, uh, you know, they've been asking for several uh, for several months, actually, that uh, whether I would come on full time and uh, be an analyst on the network and an insider, but also uh, be a managing editor to create a hockey department. And so the timing was right. And so in, uh, in the fall of 2001, I made the, the jump full time into uh, into television. Well, you know, and that made sense to bring you in as an analyst. I know we did that back in the day as well. And, and it's yeah. because you had your finger in the pulse of what was going on. It, like you just couldn't Google uh, Brad Treliving and find out everything you could about <laughs> from Wikipedia and what he's done lately and look at all the different news articles. You had to actually, as you said, make those calls and, and, and use your contacts to find out what was going on. 
and definitely you had your pulse, always had your pulse on, on, on the, on the game. So in addition to your career as a journalist uh, on, on TV, you've written a, n- a number of books and obviously from your experience, hockey night in Canada by the numbers, Matt Sundin's center of attention. Uh, one that I read not long ago, uh, catch 22 with Rick five. And we had Rick on the show uh, a while back. I asked him about uh, joining the Maple Leafs about the time that you were breaking in as a reporter with the team. Let's have a listen. It was like Barnum and Bailey's circus, like, and uh, Harold was a ringleader, and uh, he kind of did what he wanted to do, and he said what he wanted to say, and you know what, I mean, back then, too, uh, the big thing to remember is that he wasn't alone. I mean, the owners controlled the league back then, and uh, they had Al Eagleson in their back pocket, and they made the rules, and we had no say whatsoever. I mean, Al wouldn't negotiate on our behalf. He would go in and negotiate with them on his own and come out and say, they don't want to give you this or this, and but they're going to give you this. And so it was all about the owners. They, they controlled everything. So uh, a bestseller, a great book, by the way, a national bestseller. Uh, he talks about those crazy times uh, under Ballard and Eagleson and, did it bring back some memories for you when you when you sat down with uh, Squid to write the book? Oh, absolutely! And yeah, I was a young reporter back in the eighties when uh, when he was there, and then ultimately became captain and uh, dealt with Harold an awful lot for whatever reason. Harold liked me. My beard was longer back then, so he always called me Whiskers. I think probably because he would put my name on on occasion, but it was always Whiskers. And then I tell you, Joe, there is many a day where I'd be sitting in the office, I'd be writing my story after a practice and uh, and all of a sudden, four o'clock, five o'clock, my phone would ring and it would be Harold. And he said, Whiskers, I've got one for you today. And sometimes it was, you know, legitimate news of something that was going on, but it want, Harold wanted to be the one who told the story and Harold craved the front page. And as I said, the competition between the papers was intense back then. So if you had that story, that was a great thing. And there were days where he was just he was just goofy. He just wanted to see if he float one by uh, and uh, and get his name out there with something, you know, just being, as they say, being goofy. But uh, a lot of times he'd drop a bomb and say, "Yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna fire my general manager if we lose the next two games." <laughs> just, some days you just felt horrible because you know people's lives involved, but at the same time. He was the owner of the team, and he did do stuff like that. Where you you had to kind of walk that fine line, and of what was uh, really worth writing about, and what was just Harold being Harold. But it was never a dull moment, that's for sure. And and the older he got, the crazier he got as well. And I feel right, bad, so- Joe. I was just going to say, I feel bad for guys like Rick Vibe and a lot of the players who were on those teams in the eighties, because there was and you were there. I mean, there was some great talent on those teams. They just couldn't pull it all together, whether it was uh, having the resources for, for the management team or the coaching staff or or Harold just getting out of the way and letting them grow as a group and not putting 18-year-olds in the lineup, by, you know, four defensemen, 18 years old and a 20-year-old goalie and things like that. And those teams, I don't think, were appreciated for the talent they had because of the, the circumstance around it. And I think Ricky suffers um, historically that, he was and is one of the greatest Maple Leafs ever for his accomplishments. The first to 50, three times doing it, the 54 goal, the record until Austin Matthews a year ago. Um, but I think his history and his legacy is overshadowed because of uh, because it was the Ballard years and that was the bad Ballard years. It was pretty crazy, no doubt about it. And, and it just it took away from everything. But, uh, you know, it was hard to take the Maple Leafs serious, seriously because of the guy who was running the show. And, you know, and, and he kept uh, you know, people like Jerry McNamara and others from doing the job that they wanted to do. And, and uh, yeah. you know. Well, anyway, yeah, and, and that's it. Like if, if they wanted to do things, he would get in the way. And he had to be the, the smartest guy when he wasn't the smartest hockey guy. And then you think of all the sideshows, Joe, that you remember around that team with 
you know, Harold would be, was battling with the, with various members of the media. He was barring media from the building. I think you guys got barred at one point. Yeah, I got, I got barred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, and there's several others. And then he was, you know, he banned female reporters from the, uh, from the dressing room. And I was president of the writers at the time. So I was battling him and, and the legal for that to try and get the doors open. And I, you know, if you remember, it was a, a Wednesday night in the middle of the season, I think it was 1987, LA Kings were in town. It was no big deal. And uh, all the sports editors had gotten together at the time. I wasn't sports there yet, but I was president of the writers. And we decided we had to do something about the, he banned everybody from the room over uh, his lawyers were very smart. They said, if, if you ban women, uh, if you ban everybody, then you're not just banning women. So we decided that right. enough was enough. And, and it was so unfair for the players having to do interviews and hallways and things like that. And uh, so we just uh, stormed the Bastille after the game and uh, about 50 strong of media, TV, radio and newspapers. We stormed the room and Harold was in there swinging his cane at us and screaming at us <laughs> to get out of the room. Well, we eventually beat him. So we got everybody back in the room, including well, never it made for a you know never a dull moment at uh, yeah. Maple Leaf Gardens. That's for sure. It was yeah, it was something else. So uh, we got something here from Hockey Day in Canada a few years ago. Uh, you shared some of your member uh, memories from the '87 Canada Cup. Let's roll that, Vic. When Cannon went down 3 0, uh, Wayne Gretzky came to the bench and he said to Keenan at that point, he says, I'm absolutely spent. I got to sit for a while. And Mike, uh, that's when they started using the unsung heroes. And Huey talked about it in his piece how you need more than just stars to make a team. And that's when the unsung heroes, the props and the Sutters and the Murphys, went out and got the job done and got them back in the game. But Mike said he looked down at the Soviet bench next to him at Cops Coliseum and Tikhonov kept looking over at him like he had three heads. And he says, he absolutely knew what was going through his mind. He says, that madman has just benched Wayne Gretzky the biggest game of the tournament what was it that brought that team together well it was interesting because i had a, a, a major major story on the eve of the semifinals when uh, uh canada was playing the checks as i'd found out that uh earlier in the tournament <clears throat> there was a bit of a rebellion amongst the players because of mike and uh they mm-hmm. found that after the first game of the tournament in Calgary, they tied 4-4. I think it was against the Czechs. And, uh, you know, all the fans, they'd been out west. They'd been in Montreal and then out west in Banff for training camp for a month and everything and away from their families. And all the families came in for that first game. And then, you know, a lot were planning to go out for dinners and whatnot after, afterwards. And Mike put up like a 10.30 curfew on the players. And then he was just grinding them, <laughs> grinding them, grinding them. And finally, at one point, in the tournament, uh, I think it was Gretzky, Messier, uh, Bork, and a, a, and a few others went to Eagleson, who was running the Canada Cup, and said, and, and Team Canada, and said, you know, either this guy calms down or we're going home. We didn't sign up for this kind of abuse. And Eagleson went to Keenan and told him, and he says, Mike goes, mission accomplished. And what Mike's method to the madness was, is he, he said he had players from, you know, assorted teams from, you know, Montreal, from Edmonton, from right. New York, from all these places. And they and the players had a different mindset back then that they it was not unlike seventy two where the they hated each other, but you know, some of the intense playoff battles yeah. that they had back in the day. And, you know, Philadelphia didn't like Edmonton after they'd gone to the two finals and you had all these players interspersed and so Mike thought the only way I'm gonna get these guys together as a team quickly is if I give them a common denominator and that's to hate me. And so he 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 went and was hired Mike and uh, and ultimately pulled that team together. So I found out about it, as I say, probably about a week after it had happened. And it was the eve of the semifinal game, and they started to get better as a team after they pulled together. And Mike's madness working. And uh, so I wrote this story that appeared on the morning of the semifinal game in Montreal. And I remember the night before. I get back to my hotel room as, as fitting in Montreal. It was probably around two in the morning and the red light was flashing on the phone. And as a reporter, when that message light was fla- was flashing, that was always, you know, oh. struck horror in your heart because, oh God, did, did I get scooped by the other paper? What's happened? What happened? Well, it was Eagleson on, leaving a message and he says, it's, he's screaming on the phone. He says, you've got 
somebody who I talked to about the story off the record had ultimately told Alan that they had talked to me or I knew about it and was writing this story. And so he's screaming on the phone. He says, you got to kill the story. He says, it can't run before this game. This is our biggest game. We can't lose it. He says, if we lose this game, it's all on you. The country's going to have it all on you. (laughs) (laughs) That's a lot of pressure. Yeah. I'm I'm a young guy at the time, uh, but it's two in the morning. The paper's already on the streets. So uh, uh, they managed to win the game, thankfully. And uh, when the, the series shifted, a couple of days later, it shifted to Hamilton, and at the press conference, uh, a reporter asked uh, asked Keenan, said, uh, "You know about this story uh, that was written in the Sun? Um, that's not true, eh, Mike? And uh, there was no rebellion." And Mike just looked at him, and uh, I've never forgotten this. Uh, Mike looked at him, and he said, "Well, I know who wrote it, so it must be true." So that was a very <laughs> cool moment. Because usually you get, wow. as you know, Joe, you get the denials and it was fabricated, misquoted, blah, blah, blah. And Mike just said, no, it was true. That's crazy. And that that's so good. I mean, what, what a story, though, galvanized by their hatred of, of Mike Keenan. <laughs> and that's what uh, brought that team together. <laughs> wow. But yeah, yeah you're, you're right, because it was the same kind of thing in 76. It was the same kind of thing, you know, or 84 and, you know. Every time they uh, tried to bring these teams together, there was always infighting. And I remember, you know, the Oilers versus the Islanders earlier than that, right? So, yeah. well, 84, 84, there was a big divide between the Oilers and Islanders, as you mentioned. And uh, I think it was in the semifinals, they were playing the Soviets and not playing very well. And it didn't look like they were going to win. They were losing. And I think it was after the first period, I think it was Larry Robinson stood up in the room. And, uh, and it might have been Bobby Bourne from the Islanders, but stood up and said, boys, I know you hate him and he hates you, but we're playing for this crest now, not the Oilers, not the Islanders, not the Can- Montreal Canadiens. We're playing for this crest. And if we don't win, we're going to own this and be embarrassed forever. So we better pull together here and get the job done. And lo and behold, that was the, the game when, you know, Coffee made the great defensive play and, uh, and they scored and, and, and ultimately won and then beat the Swedes in the final. Yeah, that was Larry. We had him on the show. We asked him about that moment. And, and uh, you know, he was kind of humble about it. But, yeah, he was the guy yeah. that, that made that statement and got that thing working. So uh, another book you wrote, uh, Hockey Night in Canada, My Greatest Day. Tell us about uh, about this book. Well, that was real cool because I, I went to 50 different people in hockey. It could be players, coaches, managers, uh, trainers, I think, and uh, and just said, complete the sentence, my greatest day in hockey was, and some fascinating stories. And it wasn't always just, well, when I won the Stanley Cup, sometimes it could have been my first, a first goal, a first game, various different things. And, and one of the most unique stories and interesting stories was Wayne Gretzky. And so I, I, I phoned Wayne and I said, here's what I'm doing. Here's the sentence. Uh, but I'm going to give you a couple of weeks. And, uh, think about it and uh and then we'll talk and uh so you know knowing just how many great moments he had in his hockey career yeah and uh so a, a couple of weeks later he was remember he was uh, had a charity golf tournament pro am golf tournament it was up north in Collingwood area so I went up that day they had a media day and uh went up and I sat down with him have a coffee and I said okay and read the tape recorder going and I said uh, my greatest day in hockey was, and he just looked at me with a big smile and he said, my last game. And I go, what? <laughs> of all the things, your last game. And he said, my last game, because that day, my mom and dad were staying at our place in New York. He says, that day I got up, it was an afternoon game. He said, I got up in the morning and I drove the, to the rink with my dad and we talked hockey. And he says, it was just like, when I was six years old, driving to the rink with my dad, talking hockey. And he said, it brought it all full circle. My whole career had been pulled together at that point. He says, I was content with my decision to retire. And it just brought a flood of memories back for me of all those times, being in the car, driving to the rink with my parents, having them in the stands for that game. uh, And then thinking about everything that I'd accomplished 
from being a you know young boy growing up in Brantford to you know standing on that stage in Manhattan when he retired in '99. So it just blew me away with the story. And I said, once again, Gretzky takes it to another level of where you don't think anybody would go to summarize a, a career like that. Beautiful. I was like, uh, I'm getting emotional just hearing them talk about yeah. that because you think about that career, you know, kind of winding down on that day and getting to share that moment with with uh, with Walter, who, uh, you know, was rumored to be dead at one time back in the late 80s by a friend of ours. <laughs> but uh, oh, yeah. yeah, so uh, well, he said he, to the, during that ride, he said, Walter kept saying, don't don't retire. One more year. Give me one more year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it, Dad. It's time. It's time. He said, so the hardest yeah. part was telling your dad after all those years together and everything he did to get me to where I went, where I was, to tell him, nope, I'm not playing anymore. But he did. Yeah. What a fabulous That's it, for family, sure. Family story. Yeah, well, yeah. I think I heard Gretzky talking not that long ago uh, about uh, his decision to retire, and somebody said. Well, I mean, he had nine points in, in, you know, in like a couple of months or something like that. He showed some signs and he said, I used to have nine points in a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was a weekend for me. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not the same when you're not, the, you know, you're getting, you know, not quite the, the same vision you had before, getting hit a little more often. And, you know, it just wasn't the same Gretzky. And he made that well, choice. And, and, and the great ones can leave when they're still near the top they're not at the top yeah near the top and and they leave with the the memory of them being still great not being a guy who was hanging on and you know falling from first line to fourth line and just hanging on for a paycheck right he couldn't figure out anything else to do in his life so the great ones know when it's the time a more recent book you wrote, uh, the 50th anniversary of the 1972 Canada Russia series, 1972, the series that changed hockey forever. Uh, you know, that's a show in itself, obviously, but give us uh, one or two important things that you might have learned by putting this book together. Well, I mean, it, I, I'd written after the 20th anniversary, and then <clears throat> when you know 50 came around, it seemed the right time to celebrate that occasion one more time, and. I think the perspective of the players had really changed over those 30 years, the, the appreciation. They still didn't like uh, the Soviets 20 years after the series, but beyond yeah. that, they uh, started to, to really appreciate just how good they were, the kind of pressures that they were under, how different their lifestyles were. And I think maybe they also appreciated uh, in a greater way just how significant that series was and how how it did change the game and we see how it opened the doors internationally and, and, and the growth and, and the training methods and, and on and off the ice and all of that. But I think they also uh, came to appreciate and, and see just how impactful that series was on this country in a good and bad way, the bad way of the, the first four games in Canada and the good way of, of how they were able to, to rally and come together as a team uh, in Moscow and, and pull off the unbelievable and uh, and to understand the first book I wrote the title was the days Canada stood still and we did the country did stand still during those games that were in Moscow especially and you know I think the final I think our population at the time in 72 was roughly 22 million people 22 23 million and the estimate for the TV audience for those final games was close to 16 million uh, wow. for those games. So like, that's just a staggering number out of a population. And I can remember seeing pictures of, you know, you'd have the old department stores like Eaton's or, or mm -hmm. Sears or May, and, and in the, they'd have TVs in the windows and there'd be hundreds of people standing on the sidewalk, uh, you know, watching through the windows of department stores be on their way to work or, you know, coming back from lunch and, you know, schools basically shut down with TVs in, in the auditoriums and the classrooms. And then, so I think that appreciation of just how impactful it was. And, and one story that Bill Esposito shared that I hadn't heard before was that after the fifth game and when they blew the lead and, uh, uh, and lost, and then it became must win every game to salvage the series, he was having some 
heart palpitations or something. And uh, and so they quietly took him to the hospital and did some testing and uh, just to make sure everything was okay. And uh, found out that he uh, that he had a, I guess, an enlarged heart, like nothing that was serious from a health perspective. But sometimes, I guess, under the stress and everything else, they could overreact. And so he was fine, but it was a scare uh, that nobody really knew about at the time. And they kept it quiet from the team. But you think about Esposito going to the hospital with a heart issue. Henderson had fallen and suffered his concussion. Uh, but managed to talk his way back into the game, which wouldn't happen today, as we know. Uh, mm-hmm. But how would history have been different if Esposito and Henderson hadn't been able to play those final three games? Well, we know what would happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the world would, would be upside down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would never happen. So I want to talk about another great Canadian moment Uh Here's you with uh, Darren Millard and Nick Kiprios after Canada won the Olympic gold in Vancouver. Let's roll that, Vic. Like I think Babcock has said, it, there is a process there, and the process has to be seen right from start to finish. And at times, as Canadians, we probably don't have as much patience as we should have. But at the end of the day, the lack of scoring, Scott, didn't really matter uh, based on the fact that uh, they saved their best for last. Yeah, no question about it. And as you mentioned the process. It seemed they wanted to get everybody into a game situation. They juggled their lines. And once Babcock took charge of the situation, settled things down, fixed his lines, that's when they started to play better as a team. And they clearly bought into the defense first formula. In retrospect, was Babcock definitely the right guy for that team? Well, that was, excuse me, that wasn't the 2010 team, so. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Was, oh, I'm sorry. Was that 20, yeah, I was, 20, 20, I was working at CBC for, during 2010, but oh, I was okay. in Vancouver oh. for that series. So I think Babcock was the right coach for, for all the international teams. He had a, he had a way of, uh, you know, taking the temperature of the room and, and, and knowing which guys were going on any given night, and that's what makes great coaches, when, is getting a feel for who's got it, in a game and, and figuring it out early. Uh, and Mike, uh, yeah, Mike did a very good job for Canada internationally, which was why he was invited back numerous times. But that 2010 series was just, uh, you know, like golden, the golden goal in that final game with the States was just uh, riveting entertainment. Uh, going back to Babcock, what, uh, why didn't it work out for him in Toronto, do you think? Um, boy, that's a good question. Um, I don't think he was ever on the same page with management. Um, I think he wanted to do things a, a certain way. I think he wanted a composition of a team a certain way. Um, I think he might have. I think he might have got a little bit of a a big head at times in terms of how he dealt with some of his players, and we we know the stories with Marner and and whatnot um so he might have just uh, overdid it a little bit you know we talked about iron mike earlier and how he pulled that canada team together but that's a short series that's a team that not, they're not staying together for the long haul and sometimes when you're doing things that uh, you know can galvanize a team uh it can work in a short period of time but not in a, over a bigger body of work so uh so you mentioned Mike Keenan again. Of course, you've got another uh, book in the works about Mike Keenan. Uh, what? What? Uh, well, what? Tell us a little well, bit about what you find most compelling about about the Mike Keenan, the upcoming Mike Keenan book. Well, Mike's uh, well. He's going to tell all good and bad about himself and things that happened. And you know, even Mike will tell you that uh, looking back and retrospectively, that uh, he said, "Boy, I did a." I did a lot of goofy stuff back in the day <laughs> that wouldn't fly today. Right. That's for sure. But, uh, but, uh, you know, he just, uh, he wanted every level and, and just has a lot of great stories to tell. And he's, he's coached some of the greatest players in the game. And, uh, you know, he's won a Stanley cup. He got the Stanley cup finals. He won the Canada cup. Uh, you know, the backstories there, some of which we've talked about, uh, here today. So mm-hmm. there's just, he's, he's got a lot to tell and, uh, and a lot of, you know, hockey stories, the stuff that happens behind the scenes, the funny stuff, the tough stuff, uh, relationships with players, uh, you know, Brett Hall, his relationship with him was famous. And the two of them have uh, beyond kissed and made up about 
admitting to each other publicly that I was wrong. No, I was wrong. I was wrong. And it was just uh, some great, uh, great tales that Mike's, uh, Mike's going to tell. And uh, I'm just finishing up. Uh, we're getting we're into Mike's, putting Mike's book together. And I've just finished up a book with Doug McLean called Draft Day, right. which is uh, not so much Doug's story, but a lot of stories that involve Doug from uh, his years of coaching and managing in the NHL and at, uh, at other levels. And uh, just stories about hockey stories about teams and how they were put together and uh, players and uh, and coaches and managers. So it's that's an interesting read as well. So 2006, uh, you received the uh, Elmer Ferguson Award from, in, from the Hockey Hall of Fame. Uh, quite a class. There was Patrick Waugh, Dick Duff, Herb Brooks, Her- Arlie Hotchkiss. Uh, what was that moment like for you to be, you know, put into that cat- into that grouping? Well, and Peter Marr was the uh, broadcast, the Calgary Flames uh, announcer, and we did a couple seasons here in Toronto as well, I think, on the Leafs radio, but uh, he was the broadcast winner, Foster Hewitt Award. I mean, it was a huge thrill, and it's you know, it's the old line you, you hear the players and, and builders mention all the time is that you don't get in the game to win awards. You get in the game to, to in the case of, of covering it as a writer, to, uh, you know, to be there, to be on the front lines, to, to cover the big games and to, to write the big stories, break news and, uh, and just be a part of that. That's uh, the pinnacle of, of the business if you want to be in, involved in hockey media and uh, or hockey writing media. And, uh, so to be honored by your peers in that way, to say that uh, your body of work over a career that was still unfolding at that point, but the, the body of work that you've done it to that point was worthy of, uh, of that level of recognition was just uh, overwhelming. It was uh, uh, just a, an absolute thrill and humbling in its, in its own way as well. And, uh, you know, you never forget that day and you never forget when they gave you that plaque and sitting in the great hall when the, when your name's announced and the, the camera clicks to you and uh, sitting there and I was with uh, my wife and son and uh, we have a picture that sits on our, on our counter of uh, the three of us and the award and from that night and uh, you never forget a day like that. It's, uh, <clears throat> as I say, very humbling and uh, a very emotional and exciting day and then to be able to share it with uh, so many family and friends and colleagues was uh, was amazing. There was a hangover the next day, Joe, if you want to know. <laughs> okay. Another testament to a great career. You, uh, you've joined the selection committee for the Hockey Hall of Fame. Uh, that has to be quite an honor, you know, being asked yeah, to totally. be part of, that, part of that. Yeah, excuse me. <clears throat> it was uh, back in November when the, was the Monday of the, uh, of the Hall of Fame uh, <clears throat> awards or ceremony. And during the, uh, at uh, noon hour, there's a luncheon for the media honorees, the, the Elmer Ferguson and the and the Foster Hewitt winners. And uh, I was there, and uh, Lanny McDonald, who's the chair of the Hall of Fame, sort of we're, a bunch of us were standing around having a having a drink and chatting. And uh, before the lunch start started, rather, and Lanny grabbed him by the elbow and he says, uh, "I got to talk to you for a sec." So we go off into a corner, and he says to me, he says. Uh, we just had a, a board meeting today, and uh, we have a we have to fill a spot on our selection committee. And uh, your name was uh, put forth, and uh, we had the discussion about it. And uh, uh, unanimously, uh, everybody on the board and uh, uh, of the committee and the and the hall uh, thought that you would be a great choice to to join the group. And uh, will you do it? And I looked and I said, "Are you kidding me?" Yes, <laughs> and that was just. <laughs> absolutely blown away it's just like oh my god what an honor to be a part of that and uh so it's uh he said the only catch is he says i gotta go back and tell the board so you can't say anything because we're going to announce it tomorrow so i sat at this lunch with all these people all my friends around and, wow and not and couldn't say anything and then went to the ceremony that night and uh and saw everybody from the hockey world and uh couldn't say anything and then uh, next day they, i could tell my son he said that was okay <laughs> and, uh, yeah 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 uh, and then made the announcement the next day so it was uh it was an absolute thrill to be to be honored with the ferguson and then to be asked to, to be a part of that committee was again very special so like a lot of people don't know how much charity work you do uh the dr j charitable foundation children's grief program 
Uh, you're also chair of the Cons My Sports Celebrities Dinner for Easter Seal since 1995. Uh, that's a lot of fun. Uh, it, a lot of work involved in that? A lot of work, but uh, we have great, well, the Easter Seals uh, people have a uh, just an absolute great staff, but uh, they do the bulk of the heavy lifting, and then I chair the dinner committee, and uh, we help to put together the uh, the head table, the celebrities, and uh, uh, we have a great time doing it because we have a, a just a fabulous group of people. Um, so we make sure that it's fun, and uh, and uh, you know, and we know obviously it, it's for a great cause, and. Uh, you know, there's been times over the years when it sort of, you know, everybody gets tired and you sort of say, well, maybe, maybe I have to take a step back after this year. And then, you know, you, you sit there at the dinner and you see those kids and the challenges that they have in their lives and just how they, they can still sit there with a big smile on their face and the thrill of them being honored at a dinner like that. But you see, you hear the stories of what this, these children are going through and you say, you know what, I can suck it up for another year and help out and and you're really happy when at the end of the night we've raised a few hundred thousand dollars and you're knowing it's going to send these kids to the camp or getting them the equipment <clears throat> and the facilities that they need to to have a, a happy <clears throat> excuse me, a happy life. So uh so we keep going with that and uh, and it's uh, as they say it's a it's become a labor of love. And then you mentioned the Dr. J. It's now the the grief center, but the uh, it's a golf tournament that I run every year uh, in the memory of my uh, wife, Kathy, who passed away in 2008 uh, from a brain tumor cancer. And so we raise money every year uh, for uh, the Pencer Brain Tumor Center, which is at the Princess Margaret Hospital and the Grief Center, which was, uh, it was the Dr. J at the time, uh, which is counseling that uh, grief counseling that my son was able to go through. Um, well, Kathy was was sick and then ultimately after she passed away and it was invaluable for both of us being able to cope with it and it's an invaluable service that sadly is is not funded by government uh in the province or i don't even think in the country so they keep these centers going um you know fundraising is very important yeah i'm i'm familiar with the brief families of ontario uh, Durham region we went to to see them uh, after we lost her son. It was it was a it's really a valuable um, uh, asset for the community to have that, and, and, and it's you know it's a place to go uh, where you just don't know where to go. You know it's, it, things get tough and it's hard to go through, and we have to go through. You know as human well, beings, but you know when you have <laughs> that sort of you know support. It's 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 good to take advantage of that for sure, no doubt about it. So, um, from the Consmite dinner, I believe this is two thousand three, uh, courtesy producer Vic, who uh, was uh, on the production team for that. Let's have a listen. Yeah, Vic was it's part of our team. Time to get up here. It's the first time a politician has ever gone short on a speech, but we're not complaining. It's amongst uh, a couple of concerns I bring tonight. It's the first time I ever thought that. Uh, Don Cherry would look subdued next to me. <laughs> the other part is I had to get a night off work and I left the, the hockey department at Sportsnet in the capable hands of Nick Kiprios. I felt pretty confident about that until I looked over here just a few minutes ago and there's Kipper sitting there, so... <laughs> I, I'm sure everything's fine. So I mean, you guys obviously have a, have a lot of fun at that at that event. Yeah, it is. It's uh, as they say. There's there's the poignant moments where you you get to know the the kids and understand the challenges that they have, and and you see some stories that just absolutely blow you away emotionally. And uh, but then yeah, the the celebrities that come are just so generous with their time, and uh, and in most recent years for for many years now gord stellick and christine simpson do the uh the interviews with the celebrities up on stage and uh and uh it's very light and uh you know it's often insightful because it's their stories but uh very light and uh and entertaining as well so it's uh it is a an incredibly fun night and uh it's amazing because uh, as the years have gone on we don't even have to announce our head table and we're close to sold out it's just repeat customer because everybody un understands how important the, the cause is of Easter Seals and then how enjoyable the night is. So uh, 
uh, yeah, we have a blast with it. So I want to talk a little bit before you go about the uh, the team that you've covered since the late seventies, the Maple Leafs. Uh, what do you think about the uh, the hiring of Brad for living? Well, I think you know he's certainly he brings experience. He he's worked in a Canadian market. Uh, you know, and Calgary is an intense Canadian market from a media perspective, and the and the challenge is to win. And he had an owner who was challenging him hard to win as well. Um, so he brings experience. He's he's media savvy. I think he's a smart hockey guy. Uh, I think you know what he was able to pull off uh, last summer when the, the challenges of Goudreau and and Kachuk leaving mm. and to make the trade that he did with Florida at the time. I just blown away now did it work out this past season to the way they would have liked no uh but i think there was reasons for that and uh i think going forward uh, you know conroy and his team there will have a different approach to how that team plays and i think you'll see a huberto bounce back and have you know a season like he did the year before with florida or close to it and Uyghur, who just came off a great world championships for team canada so I think uh, there should be, you know, we have to see who they bring as coach, and I'm not throwing it on. Daryl wanted to play a certain way, and Daryl's a very good coach, but I don't think it was a fit for some of the players, and, and probably Hubert Doe was one of those players. So I think if uh, whatever adjustments they make, if they're the right ones, then you could see a, a real bounce back. But getting back to the point is I thought uh, under really, really difficult circumstances that uh, Brad pulled off a, a remarkable trade. So he's he's done a lot of good things in his career. And uh, now he walks into Toronto and uh, a lot of challenges ahead. There's no doubt about that. Contractually, cap-wise, he's got to figure out a lot of free agents. So uh, he's got his work cut out for him. Should he keep Sheldon what Keefe? Think? What do you think well, of Brad? <laughs> Well, I think it's a good hire. I mean, I know that uh, it, it's kind of the, the guy I thought right from the beginning would be the guy because uh, Shanahan had it said he wanted somebody with experience. He wasn't going to go back to somebody who had done it before like Dubas. And so, uh, yeah, Trilling, Trilling has got the experience. He's been around. He's a smart guy. And, and uh, I, I can see him doing a good job here. W- whether or not he should keep Sheldon Keefe I, I think probably it, it's a safe thing to do, if you know what I mean, right? If you keep the coach that's already there and give him a run and then say f- five months into the season, it's not working out. Well, say three months into the season, it's not working out. Then you can, all, you can always bring in your own guy. Probably not Daryl Sutter, but your own guy, right? <laughs> what yes. do you think? Well, it definitely won't be Daryl, I can tell you that. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I mean, you, you can look at Keith's body of work and you know 100 point seasons the last few years uh, you know they they did win around uh and maybe you, I, probably the first thing you do is the gm you sit down and you you talk philosophy of how you want you how you as the manager wants the team to play the style the type of player that should be on the roster and then get a sense from the coach if he's willing to go along with that because as we just talked about they had a uh a situation in Calgary where the coach and the manager weren't on the same page with respect to the team and how how they wanted it to play. So you got to make sure that you're together uh, that way. And <clears throat> I'm sure that conversation will be had between Brad and uh, and Sheldon, and uh, and then you you make your decision. But uh, you know, you often hear you know managers come in and say, "I want to bring my own guy." If he has somebody that is definitely his guy, then make the move now and, and, and move on. Yeah. Uh, but if it's right, if it's a wide open field, then, then maybe you bring him back and, and see if he can get on the same philosophical page. Yeah. I think the rule of thumb is that uh, you, every GM gets at least one coaching change. And if you make yes. it now, right. If you make it now, have you, have you used up your, your coaching change card, right? No, true enough. I mean, it's uh yeah, I, I think you just got to have a feel, and and you know that Brad's been was watching that team, and he he's got a feel for how it was coached and how they responded to situations during the various playoff series and down the stretch and whatnot. So he's not coming in uh, not knowing what this team's been about and how it's played and how the coaches have reacted, responded in the game and between games. Okay, so one last question before we go. Uh, Florida Panthers. 
uh, number eight seed. Could you have foreseen this at all before the playoffs started? No. <clears throat> um, a lot of people compare it to L.A. Uh, several years ago. But I think and L.A. made a coaching change that season and brought in, ironically, Daryl Sutter. Um, but L.A. that year, as the eighth seed, they should have been a higher seed. They were a team that underperformed during the season. Uh, thus, the coaching change. And they got better as the year went on. And so they were they were seeded eighth, but they, they weren't really an eight-seeded team. Uh, whereas, based on the season that uh, Florida had and the fact that they only got in the final week and they only got in because Pittsburgh lost to Chicago of all teams uh, and they were able to win the handful of games down the stretch. No, I don't think anybody saw them coming in and being the power that they've been through these playoffs. And I remember watching that first round against Boston. And even when they were down 3-1, I was talking with some friends and I said, they've been in every game and they've been a handful for Boston. They're fast. They're fast. Their forecheck is ferocious. Um, they've been close. I never th- saw them. I would never have predicted they would come back and win that series. And But since then, no surprises. They play the same way every night. And the goaltending, obviously goalie Bob has is, is found his game, and he's been the goalie Bob of a few years ago. And Kachuk has been incredible. And, uh, yeah, they're just uh, – it's going to be a fascinating series. I, I, I'm not sure who I would pick at this point. But I, I guarantee you this, it's going to be physical. There's going to be a lot of body contact between Vegas and Florida, two teams that play very similar from the standpoint of being physical and intense on their forechecks. I yeah, think it's Sam going to be a great Bennett series. Was a handful. Oh, Sam yeah. Bennett was a handful well, for, for the Maple Leafs, no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah, that he, one, he's been good. One hit he, the one hit he had on, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to think it was the defenseman coming around the net. He reminded me of Wendell Clark back Hall, in the maybe? day. Was no, it was in Hall, the uh, it was in the last series. <clears throat> oh, the last series. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it was it, right. it, it was just Wendell Clark vintage. The, the defenseman yeah. just coming around the net, and he was just bang right in him, clean check, just put him into orbit. Right. Yeah. He's 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 something else. So. Um, yeah, I I don't know. It's gonna be a good series. It'll, it'll be fun to see. I mean, I, the ten day rest uh, might be might be maybe too much. I don't know. We'll find out. But uh, but Brofke got to yeah. he can keep it up. Obviously, they got a real good shot. Yeah, I mean, sometimes as you know, <clears throat> teams can get a little rusty when it's that's too many days. Uh, but of course, then you factor in. You got to look at how severe some of your injuries are, and you could see some players heal up in a good way. And the feeling seems to be that it's going to be a good break for goalie Bob because he loses it when he gets fatigued. And uh, uh, so after some intense series, there were short series, but intense series, uh, the break might be really good for him. Yeah. Goalie Bob, love it. All right. Thanks, Scotty. It's been a pleasure having you on, buddy. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. Well, thanks for asking, Joe. Enjoyed it. and uh, Great to see you again. All right, buddy. More sports when we come back. My Costa Swiss pick of the week. Last week, I took the number eight horse, Dealer's Delight, in the opening race on Thursday night's card. Now, Dealer's Delight was a late scratch, but I also told you to box a 568 exacta, and wouldn't you know it? The six horse, Smashing Rackets, won this trotting event for Phillies and Mares. Bob McClure, the driver, number five, Sayonara Angel was second. The six five exacta return, $17.90. This week, week, I'm looking at Thursday night's opening race at Mohawk. First leg of the grassroots series for three year old trotting Phillies. And the two horse, once again, Smashing Rackets, with Bob McClure driving us coming off that big win over some tough competition. I also like the 234 Exacta and Trifecta box. For all the racing updates, visit Cosa TV on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Go to hpibet.com for your wagering options. Joe Tilly Sports is brought to you by Cosa. 
Central Ontario Standard Bread Association, providing a united voice for harness horse people racing at Ontario tracks. Check out your benefits today at COSAonline.com and check out COSA TV on Facebook and YouTube for all the latest harness news and live action updates. Live racing year-round. Go to HPIBet.com for all your wagering options. Become a member today and your first bet is free. That's HPIBet.com. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center, saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life. Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports. Top of the line, imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com. We want to thank all the folks who make this show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all-around great people. We highly recommend them all. Thank you for your support of Canadian sports. A reminder, the show is available on iTunes, Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, as well as the Spanglish Network and Zingo TV and Buzz TV Live. Also, check out the show on YouTube. All of our past great shows are there. Lots of clips, lots of fun stuff. Like and subscribe. It is absolutely free. Thanks once again to Scott Morrison for being on the program. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Do you want to buy or sell a home? Could 31 years of real estate experience help you? Why not speak to an amazing team that loves to overpromise and over-deliver? Aldo has a tremendous team of experts on staff. They are committed to making your next real estate transaction smooth and comfortable. Call 416-GET-ALDO or visit getaldo.com. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family and your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did. 905-686-5678. MNP, a leading Canadian national accounting, tax, and business accounting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the need of their clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Through partner led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost effective approach to do business and personal strategies to help people and organizations to succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Mississauga, Burlington, and more. Their team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca today to learn more.